Hello, everyone. I'm Burke Glass, Marketing and Communications Director at Boston University's College of Communication. Welcome to today's event, Discover Your Food Love Language. This event is being recorded and will be available later all over the internet, including on the Boston University's Alumni Association website, the College of Communication website, and on comms YouTube channel. Before we meet our moderator and panel, quick word about today's format. You'll be able to submit questions throughout the discussion and we'll save time toward the last part of our hour together to pose as many of them as we can to our panel. To submit a question, use the Q&A box rather than the chat. You can find it by hovering over your computer screen, locate the Zoom bar and select Q&A. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce the moderator of our discussion, Jacqueline Sinclair. Jacqueline Sinclair is a Boston-based journalist and food enthusiast. Currently, she's a contributing perform performing arts writer and critic for WBUR's The Artery. Often her writing seeks to highlight creatives and organizations who, whose work is at the intersection of art and activism, from a narrative restaurant that focuses on sharing diverse stories of food, memory, and identity, to a pop-up dinner proprietor paying homage to indigenous food, farm traditions, and food producers from the non-European diasporas. Take it away, Jacqueline. Thank you, Bert. Hi, everyone. As Bert mentioned, I'm Jacqueline, your moderator. Today, we're here to discuss food marketing. Our panelists will talk about the ins and outs of building community, running the social accounts for top food publications, restaurants, and entrepreneurial ventures. I'm excited to introduce our panelists today. First, we have Phoebe Melnick, Senior Video Producer for Martha Stewart Living at Dot Dash Media and Brand Manager for Bonnie's, a Brooklyn-based Cantonese-American restaurant. Previously, Phoebe worked as a producer and director for Food Network Kitchen and as a producer for Thrillist and Food and Wine. Then we have Priyanka Nike, a self-taught vegan chef, TV host, and author. Priyanka is a Food Network champion, Quibi Dishmantled winner, TV personality, and author of a cookbook, The Modern Tiffin, which is out now. An avid traveler who's been to 40 countries, her globally inspired recipes with a focus on sustainability have been featured on her blog, Chef Priyanka, IGTV hosting her own digital series, Cook with Chef Pri at Three, and are incorporated into her speaking appearances. She's garnered attention from and been featured on The Kelly Clarkson Show, Forbes, Glamour, The Today Show, Bon Appetit, CNN, and many more. She's partnered with hundreds of brands globally, including Coca-Cola, Amazon, and Spotify for campaigns. Priyanka's Indian heritage is very important to her, and she weaves in Indian elements in her cooking. She attributes her devotion to her Indian roots and passion for Indian food to her loving and supporting parents. Our third panelist is Olivia Quintana, Associate Social Manager for Bon Appetit and Epicurious. She graduated from Boston University in 2018 with an English degree and journalism experience from the Daily Press and the Boston Globe. She's been working in social media since graduation and has four years of experience working across brands, nonprofits, and political advocacy organizations. In her current role, she specializes in copywriting, content creation, and social strategy across platforms with special attention to Pinterest. She's passionate about sustainable sourcing, and elevating diverse voices in food. And for fun, she enjoys cooking, baking, and hanging out with her dog. So let's get started. Olivia, what's it like being the voice of some of America's beloved food brands? Yeah, I, I think it's such a privilege to be able to be the voices of these food brands. Both Bon Appetit and Epicurious have been around for a while, and these are really nostalgic brands. I feel like people are always telling me about how their parents or grandparents subscribed. Um, and so I, I really love being able to adapt so much of that great content and that legacy content to social and get to bring it to new audiences or the same audiences in a different way. Nice. Phoebe, what about you? Uh, I feel very similarly to Olivia. Um, Martha Stewart is kind of an OG. She was a trailblazer, maybe one of the original influencers. Um, so getting to work in video for her is extremely exciting. Um, we can expand beyond just her name and hopefully showcase new names who will be new Martha's, new household names. I like that. 
Uh, Priyanka, I understand that question um, might be a little different for you because you are the brand, but we'd love to hear about your journey too. Yeah, I think, it, yes, it is different because I am representing myself all over the interwebs and on TV. And yes, technically I am my own brand. And I think, I think the fun and interesting thing about that is over the past many years that I've built my brand, I think what's worked the best is um, really just being myself. I think that's what is cool about being a quote unquote influencer, but also being your own brand is that people care to see kind of the real you and not like a curated, you know, kind of artificial version of yourself. And don't get me wrong, like my whole feed is curated in a way, but everything I put out there is very true to who I am. So the core things that I love to focus on are obviously vegan cooking, but sustainable cooking and sustainable life sustainable fashion. Um, so it's kind of a whole lifestyle for me. And that's what I strive to emulate through my brand. And I think that's what I've done pretty successfully and have, and I'm continuing to build on. Wonderful. Thank you guys. So how did you find your way into the food industry? Let's start with you, Phoebe. Um, sure. So I was studying at BU um, in film and TV, and I got an internship my sophomore year working on America's Test Kitchen. So I interned for them. Um, I was a production assistant for one of the seasons that they were filming, and I became really close with the crew. And so they brought me on to another show. So I worked on Simply Ming, and I just absolutely fell in love with it. Um, cooking shows are a blast to work on when you have a good crew and you know, sophomore year, I was like, this is, this is my path. I'm going to work in cooking shows. So um, I snagged an internship at Martha Stewart when I was still in school um, and found my way back to her later on in life. <laughs> nice. And what about you, Olivia? This is actually my first role in the food industry. Um, I've like, I've always been passionate about food. I've always wanted to work in food. So it was sort of um, a dream, but before this, most of my work focused on nonprofits and I was doing digital and social media across a few different ones. And when I was ready to leave the nonprofit industry, I started looking for jobs in food media. And so went up to an Epicures for hiring for their social team at the time. And I, my boss really took a, a chance on me <laughs> um, and sort of gave me my opportunity. You know, I think, I also think sometimes people think that to get into food, you have to be a recipe developer or a professionally trained chef. And there are a lot of different ways to get into the industry. You know, like the industry needs copy editors, social media managers, video producers. Um, so I think I would encourage people just find, find what, the, what they can offer and, and sort of find their way in. Definitely. Priyanka, when did you decide to become a chef and how long did it take you to build a loyal following? Wait, I have to ask Phoebe, did you work with Ming Tsai? I did. I worked oh my God, I love Ming Tsai. I used to watch his show so much when I was little. I just have to say that. And then if you follow him on TikTok now, he's just as great. But anyway, that was a side. <laughs> he's lovely. And I'll show you a selfie of all of us in the kitchen later. It's very funny. Oh my God, yay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? I oh, was no so <laughs> uh, I just asked, when did you decide to become a chef? And how long did it take you to build a loyal following? So, yeah, I think my kind of whole trajectory and growth in this space is very atypical. I'm a self-taught chef. I, um, I did not go to culinary school. That was very intentional. I did not, you know, train as a line cook in a restaurant, um, which it wasn't necessarily intentional or not. It's just not the way my kind of path, how it, you know, led to where I am today. Um, and also, I do manage multiple careers. So I am a chef, but I also have a pretty senior role at Twitter. So I do work in tech. I have a whole background that's unrelated to this. And I studied economics at uh, CAS at BU. So nothing related to food, um, which makes this even more interesting. But um, I've been cooking pretty much my, my whole life. It's been an integral part of my life. I'm first generation Indian. So I think like with most immigrant families, food is really like the center of the culture. And that's how you really get to learn about the culture and stay in touch with it. So my parents are excellent cooks. Um, I went to India every single year of my life. And through my kind of observation of my parents and my culture and generally 
my family, I really was, I picked up on a lot of different techniques, cooking styles, flavors. Um, and I also watched a ton of cooking shows. So I religiously watched the Martha Stewart show, all of the Food Network shows when I was little. So to me, it was like cartoons and cooking shows like went hand in hand. And I learned a lot of Western cooking techniques through watching those shows. So uh, ultimately, when I started my blog uh, over 10 years ago now, so I'm kind of aging myself, but over 10 years ago, um, I really began developing recipes then and putting my craft out there and really empowering people to, at the time, cook vegetarian food. And that evolved into a lot more. I ultimately got on a Food Network show called Cooks versus Cons. I won the show in 2017 and became a Food Network champion. And my sort of cooking career really took off from there. And so since then, um, I have been focused on doing recipe development for brands and brand partnerships and campaigns, but also doing a ton of TV work where I really try to use my skill set to teach people how to cook. And in my case, it's now vegan and sustainable cooking while weaving in my culture and my travels. So um, certainly a very atypical journey, but that's kind of how I, um, how my trajectory has worked through this industry and, and I'm here today. Nice. Well, since food is such a, you know, an integral part of all of our lives, I'd like to talk about your first food centered memory. Is there, you know, like a soup that your grandma made or a dish that your, your mother made that made you feel loved? Um, can you talk about that? And let's start with you, Priyanka. Um, wow, I have a lot of food memories. This is tough. I have a lot of bad ones too, like funny ones. But what, one funny one is when I was little, my mom used to make us eat carrots because she was like, I don't want you to have glasses like your father. So you have to eat carrots because they have beta carotene. And I hated carrots. Like she would just make me eat carrots and I hated them. And I would do that thing where you like chew it a bit, but then you like secretly spit it out in a napkin. And then you have all these like napkins piling up. But now funny enough, I love carrots because I have a new appreciation for them. So that's like a bad food memory. But I think one of my favorite food memories actually is it's, it's a true hybrid of a very classic American dish and a snack dish that is very um, specific to where I'm from in India. I'm Maharashtrian. So uh, my mom used to make us mac and cheese when we were little, like homemade, but she would serve it to us with this snack called chakli, which is made from chickpea flour or basin flour with a lot of spices into a dough. And then it's fried into these little crisps. Um, they're made throughout India in different ways and called different things, but we call it chakli. And so she would pair the chuckly with the mac and cheese. And to us, it was really good because the mac and cheese is very indulgent. It's very creamy. And then this chuckly is really spicy and it has a lot of texture. And I was obviously never able to find a dish like that anywhere in the restaurants because my mom kind of just like made it up and we always just kind of Indianified things. So I would say that's like my favorite food memory because I think it's like a true culmination of who I am. I'm born in New York City, but I'm first generation Indian. And that dish, I think, is like a true combination of those two pieces. Nice. Thank you for sharing. Olivia, what about you? Yeah, I think um, one of my like, earliest, fondest food memories is so my, so my mom is from Singapore. And um, she used to take us back when we were younger because all of her sisters and her whole family is there. And the first time we went, my uh, my whole family is like totally obsessed with food. So we landed and all my aunts are obviously like, what was, what's she gonna like? What's she gonna try? Like, what, what can we get for her? And I have this very distinct memory of being at this restaurant and my aunt ordered this like prawn dish and it came to the table and I tried one and I was just like freaking out about how good it was. It was like the first thing I was totally obsessed with. And my aunt basically was like, okay, no one else at the table can touch this. <laughs> this is exclusively for Olivia. She pushed the plate towards me. She ordered another one. And she was like, everyone else can eat everything else, but you you get to like basically dive in on this thing that you love. Um, and I just love that. I think everyone should get to appreciate the food that they love. Definitely. Well, both uh, the mac and, mac and cheese and the prawn dish sound wonderful. What about you, Phoebe? Uh, growing up, my mother was an incredible cook. She is still an incredible cook. And my grandmother was an, like just the best baker. Um, and so just one of my favorite memories was 
uh, the two of them teaching me how to make common dashing um, for Purim one year. And my grandma would make different types of jam and we would learn how to fold the cookies, which surprisingly like getting that perfect triangle form is kind of difficult. Um, and I ruined most of them, but my grandma would come around and fix them. Um, so that's probably one of my favorite memories. And every time I make those cookies, I think about that like time when I was horrible at making them and I'm still quite horrible at making them, but it makes me very happy. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's what counts, right? <laughs> well, all three of you guys make social media strategy look really easy. What tips and tools can you share to help audience members boost their followings or manage their social media presences more effectively? Um, let's start with you, Priyanka. So I think the, the two tips I can give to anyone who's trying to just build their platform is to definitely focus on the features that the um the different social platforms have newly released because they kind of favor those features and those features will help with your exposure on those platforms so for instance on instagram reels has been out for like almost two years now but um, since it's been out, it's been one of their main features on the platform to really get people posting video, short form video on Instagram. And they favor, you know, I'm calling it, they favor that feature. So when you use Reels, it gives you the ability for your uh, content to show up on the explore page and to really get pushed out there versus just showing your content to your existing followers. Um, and that kind of logic and the way that algorithm works is applicable to other platforms with their their new features as well even on pinterest like pinterest has idea pins which is kind of their version of stories they're like favoring and i'm using that word favor but like they're really pushing that new feature out there so the more idea pins you use on pinterest the more exposure you're going to get so i would say that's like the main kind of technical tip i would give to everyone is like just keep using the new um features that come out on each of these platforms and like just keep posting on there because it will help you get exposure the second thing is, is more, I would say, related probably to like a branding piece of your content. So um, I would stay consistent and true to your style, whatever that is, and not just like mimic someone else's style. There's a lot of creators I see in this space that just try to mimic other people's style. And it's like, well, you know, I see what you're doing, but it's like, it's like not, it's a kind of an off-brand version of someone else, right? And people can really see that. P people are very observant. So I think if you have your own style, just put it out there. That's what people want to see. They want to see who you really are and your, I hate this word, but your own authentic voice. And that essentially will become your brand. And if you stay consistent with that, then if someone, let's say, is not following you and your video shows up on their feed, then they'll recognize you because you're consistent with your style and they may have seen that before in another video that they've, they have liked. So I think staying consistent with your style is very, very much key to any creator who's trying to gain more exposure and following. Thank you. Uh, Phoebe, what about you? So my full-time job, I'm a video producer for Martha Stewart. On the side, I am, we call it brand manager um, for my boyfriend's restaurant, Bonnie's, which is a newly opened Cantonese American restaurant. So while I am well-versed in digital media, I had to learn on the job for social media strategy. Um, and so for a restaurant, I think it looks a little differently than say a personal brand or a, a national brand because it really is, about 75% customer service um, and then the rest is interacting. But beyond you know, helping book a reservation or letting the restaurant know somebody's gonna be late, a really fun part of it is getting to interact with our guests. So what worked for us because we were both having full-time jobs um, was to just kind of try new things out when we had free time. So whether that was dumping a bunch of photos into onto, um, Insta story and saving it as a re, uh, highlight um, so that everybody could see, you know, the build out process for the restaurant or sitting down to write like probably a too long post about a certain dish that maybe you generally wouldn't read if it was, if you were getting these fed all the time. We found that just sharing our personal take on everything that was happening was what helped us build a following pretty quickly. Um, 
And also, I don't think a lot of people know what it looks like to build out a restaurant. And the answer is that it's incredibly scrappy if you don't have a real team doing it. And so sharing kind of all of the mistakes that we made, I think helped. We, we just tried to be as personal as possible, as authentic as possible, because that is all we could really do and all we really knew how to do. And that worked for us. <laughs> Yeah, I like what you and Priyanka are saying about that. I think sometimes when you're getting started with, uh, you know, social, whether that's for yourself as your own brand or for work, you might uh, be fearful of showing your mistakes or your process. Um, so I think it's it's nice to hear that that's what people actually want and they're interested in seeing more of that. Olivia, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think similar to what Phoebe was just saying, I would encourage people to just just try things, you know, like, um, especially like whether you're working, whether you're a social manager or you're working on your own page, like you are on social all the time, like trust your gut. If you have an idea and you're like, I really think that this idea would resonate with this audience. I'm in there every day. I'm answering their DMs. I'm looking at the content they like already. That's, that's, that's a big advantage. And, and so trust your gut you know your audience and and just try it. You know, I think as sometimes you get to bigger legacy brands, that can be a little harder to do. Um, so if you have the ability and, and you either work for a smaller brand or it, like Priyanka, you're just building up your own brand, like try things, trust yourself. Um, I think that also fits what Priyanka was saying about like trying these new tools that every social platform comes out. You know, I think every social platform right now is really leaning more and more into video, whether it's idea pins or reels or obviously all of TikTok. Mm -hmm. So I would say if you want like a more technical piece of advice, if you want to do like food videos, get yourself a tripod. It will make your life so much easier. Um, it's really hard to film with one hand. I don't recommend trying it. Um, but yeah, I, I think my, my biggest piece of advice is just that, um, yeah, if you have an idea, run with it. Sure. Are you guys um, scheduling your posts using particular tools or are you just writing them in real time. Um, do you want to jump in on that, Olivia? Yeah, I'm happy. So we um, we do schedule our posts. You know, I, I work at two brands and we work across like four, four soon to be five platforms for each of them. And, and we're, we're a pretty small team of four. So um, we tend to use Dash Hudson um, and we also use Social Flow. Um, I've also, I think across my jobs, I've used Hootsuite, I've used Buffer, um, and I think every tool has, has their own intricacies and their own things they're best at. So um, I, I would recommend people like figure out what you really want to get out of it, which platform you want to focus on, and, and that will help you figure out what tool is best for you. Sure. Phoebe, um, what about you? Are you using a scheduling tool of any kind that you can share? I will say we are not that advanced, but what we do is typically look at, we have a kind of different way of looking at it. We'll look at um, sales for dishes at the restaurant and we'll see maybe what is not selling as much. And then we will write about that dish so that people can understand it. And we usually see a pretty nice bump in sales for that new dish. And then we can go, oh wait, now this one, we gotta, we gotta write about this egg custard now so that people wanna buy this dish. So we're not scheduling, but we're using other data that we have to help us out. Yeah, that's insightful. And Priyanka, what about you? Are you using any tools to schedule? No. So um, there's the one side where I do work with a lot of brands and there are very specific guidelines on like, you know, when it could be posted and what needs to be included in the post. And all of that is drafted ahead of time. I don't, to be honest, I don't use any other additional tools like the ones that Olivia were mentioning, because like, I just can't, like between my careers, I cannot manage anymore. <laughs> I work at a tech platform. I use social for my entire like chef brand. Like I don't need any more tools. So like I, for those reasons, I don't, but the way I manage brand partnership posts is very different than the way I manage my organic posts. And there's a very specific reason for that. One is the brand partnership stuff is very particular. So like, I just have to have it organized and the time it needs to go up and the language in it and whatever. But for my organic post, because it's just me posting as a creator, 
Um, I'm just, I'm the type that just thinks really well under pressure. I, I don't like to plan in that, in that context, because I'm, I don't, I actually write better when I'm just doing it on the, like the fly. Um, but also, um, as a food creator, as you guys probably know, there's so many random food trends that go viral and just pop up out of nowhere. So like, you kind of have to be prepared to, to make some random like yogurt toast or whatever just recently went viral, like, you know, it, it, within the week that it's happening so you can stay relevant. So for those reasons, also, I don't plan because I like to peruse, you know, TikTok to see what crazy things are being made and then either make fun of them and make a post about it or actually do the trend. So <laughs> yeah, I, um, I really agree with that. I feel like we, we have a schedule, but you should never be afraid to throw out your schedule and jump in on something when you have a good idea. Like social media, I think in general, you have to be flexible. You have to work with what's happening. So I just wanted to, to agree with you there, Priyanka. Great advice. So um, sw let's switch gears a little bit. Um, I keep reading stories that still say the food industry is, is dominated uh, by males, at least in the kitchen, right? Male chefs. Can uh, you guys talk about some of the challenges you may have faced, whether that's gender, race-based or other um, in your career thus far? And um, Olivia, let's start with you. Yeah, um, so I joined Bon Appetit and Epicurious in the summer of 2020. Um, and it's um, it was actually a moment when diversity and equity were big priorities for leadership. Um, so I, I do feel lucky that I have a pretty diverse group of coworkers at a historically white place to work. Um, but having said that, I think like any person of color or woman in a workplace, I think we all sometimes have to jump in and, and advocate for better representation or, or advocate when something doesn't feel appropriate. And I think that is something that most employers expect employees of color to sort of do uh, in addition to our daily jobs. Um, so I think I, I, I think there's a lot of work to do, but I, I do, I'm, I am really glad that I have a lot of coworkers in this moment that are willing to do that work and willing to listen. Um, so yeah, so I, th I think there are always problems, but I, I am very happy about the moment that I joined food. Um, and I think there is a, a, a big history of things being worse. So I, I'm optimistic that there are people who are really trying to change it. Wonderful. Um, Phoebe, what about you? Yeah, um, well, the food industry is definitely still very male heavy. I will say a lot of the digital media industry, specifically around food, is quite female run, which I feel very lucky to work on an entire team across like the home vertical. It's entirely women, which is incredible. Um, I've this is probably my first job I've had that experience, and it feels nice to be able to offer up ideas and feel comfortable offering up those ideas. I will say a big thing that I have dealt with in the past has been um, age working on set. Um, and that's something that comes with learning how to toughen up a little bit, which is an unfortunate thing to say. But as soon as you kind of show off a little bit of confidence, people tend to respect you a little bit more, at least on set. Um, I know that changes everywhere you go and that's a very broad generalization, but yeah. For the most part, I feel very lucky to work on such a wonderful team of women at Martha, at least. That's great to hear. Priyanka, um, can you share some of your experiences? Well, where do I begin? <laughs> Goodness. Um, I think there, I come at it from quite a few different angles. One, just being in the culinary industry as a cook and chef, and two, being in the TV industry. Um, and then three, being in the social media world, right? So I agree with Phoebe that from like a digital and social landscape, it is it is certainly dominated or at least even like even number of men and women in the space. However, like I'm sure if you were to analyze like the who are the TikTok food stars, like there's a lot of dudes there. Um, and, I, you know, I, I don't know why that is, whatever it is. But like, I, I think from a TV standpoint, um, and I also have a, like a, the restaurant standpoint too, which like, I, you know, I'm curious to hear Phoebe's thoughts on this, but I, there's many reasons why I actually don't have a restaurant is because I've hosted so many pop-ups and done so many events in restaurants. And every time I walk in, it's just men everywhere. 
and you're working at odd hours, right? Because you have to do prep, you have to design the menus. Like there's so many different things that go into it. So I'm not nest, I'm not working a nine to five, right? You're many times working very early mornings or very late nights. And sometimes it can be a little weird being like the only woman in the kitchen, like doing a pop-up and then there's all these dudes, right? So it's like, okay, like, and I always ask like, <laughs> where are the girls? And most of my friends who own restaurants are like, well, you know, a lot of women don't necessarily want to work like, these hours or like they have a family and they can't, you know, they have kids and they can't like work at, you know, 2 a.m. chopping onions or whatever it is. Right. So that was a very interesting like experience for me. And it is something about the restaurant industry. That's why I'm like, you know, I don't know if I'm, I'm not interested in that yet. Right. Plus restaurant operations is not something I want to dive into from a TV standpoint. It is very interesting. I do agree with Phoebe that if you, um, if you exude a little bit of confidence, it does certainly change the game. Um, I think looking young, like in my case, can work against you or for you, right? So it works for me because on screen, great, but like on set or working with someone, they probably think I'm much younger than I am, which I find hilarious. So it's not until I kind of open my mouth and speak and sort of like put my foot down a little bit is when people actually start to take me seriously. So ageism is a thing. Um, and being like the only female in the house is certainly a thing. And my background and my style of cooking has certainly worked against me. So being Indian, um, you know, back in the day, I would say like pre 2020, because there's been so much that happened since 2020. It was it was really hard to like get your foot through the door as someone of Indian background because I was constantly pigeonholed. They were like, oh, so you're gonna make like a samosa, right? And it's like, no, I'm not Punjabi. I'm not making a samosa. And they're like, chicken tikka masala. And I'm like, nope, that's not even an Indian dish. That is a British colonialized, you know, version of an Indian dish. So it's like, and that still happens, which I'm kind of like, someone just open up a book and read, but it happens, right? And so there is a certain, le you have to have like, I don't know how else to say this, but if you're going to be in this industry, at least like from my angle, like constantly in the media on TV, or just like dealing with all types of personalities and people, there's no way around it if you don't have thick skin, because like the things you hear people say are like, hmm, <laughs> interesting. So I get pigeonholed for the Indian thing and then the vegan thing. So I had a lot of trouble getting my food through the door first as a vegetarian chef before I even evolved into being a vegan chef. And I got rejected by large networks uh, two or three times before I finally got on because they basically told me like, hey, you know, we're not ready for a vegetarian cook. And I'm just like, well, like the rest of the world knows how to eat vegetables. Like why doesn't America know? So it wasn't until really now where people are like, well, now I'm vegan. And I'm like, great. So now it's trending. So everyone wants me, which is fine. I will take it. But at the end of the day, it's like, you have to keep, there's a lot of perseverance there that has to go into it. Like, I think what that goes with any of these sort of like modeling, acting, any of these, like you're constantly going to get rejected until someone accepts you or like believes in you kind of thing. Thank you so much for sharing. Actually, I'd like to take a question from the audience. Uh, someone asked, do you have any tips for someone wanting to break into the food marketing industry who doesn't have any experience in food other than just the general love for food and wine? I could take that one. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> just because I, this was my first job in food and I really think it's about, you just need one person to take a chance on you. And I know you hear that like a lot, especially if you're in college, but it really is true. And I think just find your way in. Like I said earlier, you don't have to be a trained chef um, and you can still be a recipe developer if you're not a trained chef, but you don't even have to be a recipe developer. Like you can just have your experience in social media. You can have your experience as a copy editor and just figure out how, when you're applying to jobs, just make it really clear that you're so passionate about food and you're so excited and you know exactly how to tailor your skills to that. Um, Cause I, I worked, to nonprofits before this. And so the, the only relationship is just understanding the digital and social media landscape. And I was still really able to combine that with my passion for food and, and I, it's, it's been going great. So I think just, just find your, find your angle and, and find that one person who will, who will take a chance on you. Yeah. Like Olivia said, I mean, we all started somewhere where we didn't have experience and you need that person to take a chance on you. I think when I'm applied for my internship at America's Test Kitchen 
years ago, I sent a very sappy note about how much I loved watching the show growing up. And that made somebody want to take a chance on me. Um, so finding that personal connection, I think if you can build a bridge that way, and also just if you see somebody, especially a BU alum who's working at a company that you really admire, don't be afraid to bug them on LinkedIn or shoot them a message on Instagram. Nine times out of 10, people want to help people who have shared interests with them. So why not just shoot your shot? I agree. Pianca, do you, do you want to tackle that as well? I think they covered it. Um, I think the like the kind of industry of food marketing is so broad, to be honest, that question is better covered by Olivia and Phoebe because I kind of, I'm I'm like the a little bit the other side of it, like the like the talent side of the business, if you want, if you kind of had to put us in categories. So like I have tips for that, but I don't, I think that question in particular was best addressed by, by them, the experts. <laughs> sure. Well, another person uh, asked about building a food brand. Um, he said that there are some chefs that he works with and he needs advice on how to develop content on a small budget. And He's not that technically savvy. <laughs> so maybe you can answer that one, Priyanka. Oh, yeah. So I think um, I think Phoebe actually mentioned this when we were talking about um, like how to build social media following. But something that I always advise um, anyone who isn't necessarily like, let's say someone like me who's creating content and putting food videos out there like all the time, but you do, you have more of like a business or a restaurant. Um, I think something that people don't have visibility into, which I believe Phoebe mentioned is like the behind the scenes, right? Like what it actually takes to, to like operate a restaurant, what it looks like in the, like the kitchen, like how service is done, like how you, how a restaurant even comes about. So I think if you are building that business, I'm not sure exactly what the specific business is or what the food brand is but I think even just taking really natural like raw like footage videos of how you're building that brand and who you're involving can be really um, interesting for people to see and also like depending on what your brand is focusing on you should follow um, other food influencers and people in the space who you think might be interested in that and see like the type of content they're putting out. And if there is potential alignment there of interest or content, you could even reach out to them to work with them. And there's so many um, food people in the, sp in the space that do like pro bono work, right? Like not everyone is getting paid to put out some of the content that they're putting out, especially if it's to help a small business. Um, so I'm not entirely sure like what the business or brand is, but that would be my advice from the start. Great. I'd love to just jump in about the not technologically savvy um, because my boyfriend whose restaurant I, I manage their brand for um, would joke that he's the less technologically, like the least technologically savvy person. And so it's about finding somebody else who can help you in your kitchen. So he has one of his sous chefs who is very good at TikTok film videos if we ever wanna use those videos. So if you're lacking in that department, see if there's somebody there who will offer their help and also I think for certain brands, you know, not being super or for super for certain platforms, not being super polished works to your advantage, um, especially for TikTok. If you are slightly chaotic, I think that might work even better for yourself. <laughs> yeah. And if I can add on, I, I also would encourage people to start with just one platform. I think when people are starting to like build their own brand or build their own business, they think, oh, I have to go viral on like, which uh, that term, I don't like that term, but, but I have to go really successful on Twitter and Instagram and TikTok all at once. And I really think if you just want to focus on one platform and get to know it and get to know, it, grow your audience there, get to know what they're interested in, try new content and and you can really have success that way of starting with that. And then if you feel comfortable, you can expand from there. But I think people sometimes just get really overwhelmed by the idea of social media and building a brand. And, and I would encourage people to just take it one step at a time and you'll get there. Right. So what about uh, campaigns that you guys have worked on? Um, what are you most proud of and why? Do you wanna start uh, Priyanka? Um, sure. I've done quite a few. I'm trying to think. Um, I've done, uh, obviously I've worked with like a ton 
a ton of food brands and um I try to work with brands that are very much in line with kind of my food philosophy and my view on the world of food and sustainability. Um, so, and, and it, it, it's like a, it's like a gray area, right? Because sometimes when a big brand reaches out and you're like, oh my God, but then you're like, oh, you're not like, you're not doing well for the environment. So it's like, I'm not really sure what to do. Um, but one campaign that I did work on last year, or one partnership that I had was with Spotify, which I thought was really cool because um, you wouldn't necessarily think like, oh, chef and Spotify. Um, but I actually love this campaign because it was uh, it was the chance for me to show like a different side of myself because it was kind of like, how does the music play a role in my creative development for food and cooking and just like other things that I'm doing in life outside of cooking because there's more to me than just, you know, <laughs> cooking in the kitchen. Um, so I really like that campaign because when the Spotify team discovered me, I actually um, didn't have that as large of a platform as I did now, which to me was like a testament to the quality of the content that I was putting out there, that they felt that um, like what I was sharing and kind of the brand that I had built was very interesting, like interesting enough to be like, one of their 10 people in this campaign. So I would say that was like the coolest campaign that I worked on last year. And I have some cooler ones this year, but I can't really chat about at the moment. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we'll have to just make sure that we stay tuned so we can find out. <laughs> Gotta follow me. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Olivia? Yeah, I think um, one campaign that I thought of when you asked this was um, in 2021, our editorial team had this great idea of, in lieu of doing our typical restaurant list or restaurant awards with the pandemic, um, they decided to have this award called Heads of the Table, which honored either chefs or people working in food who were doing work to support their communities, um, which I really loved. And we got to have our social team at, at our event at the dinner that we had for the honorees and we got to have some really great social first content to feature all of these people who are doing really amazing work um, in their local communities and we got to to ask them some personal questions and it, we just had it on our Instagram and it was really fun to be able to have this sort of um, like our Instagram community got to really experience and get to know these folks and, and that was really exciting for us and fun to work on. Hmm. Sounds great. Wonderful. Do you have anything to add or? Oh, sure. Um, when I, a uh, previous job, I worked for Thrillist and I was directing restaurant profile series, um, which I personally really loved. It was kind of right before all of YouTube turned to be very hosted. Um, so we actually got to tell stories about different people and not really worry about whether or not the host was really clicking with the audience because, you know, we'd have a new profile the next week. Um, and that was kind of a fun, lawless time on YouTube. Um, but we decided that in conjunction with Thrillist um, Best New Restaurant List coming out, that we would shoot with all the chefs that were going to be on the list. And I think I traveled to eight or nine different states in like seven or eight days. Like it was a lot of travel and it was a lot of shooting. And it was just a very, very exciting time. I got to work with chefs from all different backgrounds. I got to hear so many different stories and we produced like 13 pieces of content in two and a half weeks. And they're like seven to 10 minute long profiles. Um, so it was just a really lovely, exciting campaign to work on. Nice. Frank, I saw on your blog that you have a post called 21 Accomplishments in 2021 on your site. As the new year begins, do you outline a set of goals to accomplish for the year ahead? And if so, what's on the horizon for you? Um, yeah, well, I'm glad you read that article. <laughs> I, I started that little uh, tradition of mine a couple years ago because um, so to answer your question, like the, the reason why I do that, and then I'll tell you kind of like what, what's going to happen going forward. The reason why I do that is because I think, especially for women, there's always a lot of pressure of like, 
well, if you're of a certain age and whatever, like, you know, your success is determined by your marital set status or like, do you have kids yet? Or are you engaged? And regardless of what culture you're from, like, I think that generally holds true. I'm also from a culture that really emphasizes that. So for me, um, my life really isn't about that. It's about kind of all of these different goals that I have. So I started writing those blog posts because I think we don't spend enough time as people really celebrating even like the small things that we accomplish, let alone some of the big things and some of the things that aren't necessarily related to like these, what society deems as an accomplishment or not, like the getting married or, or you know, having kids type of thing, which I'm not saying, that, you know, I'm all happy for people who do that and that's an accomplishment, but it's not, it's just not for me. So um I started doing that and going, and it also helps me set goals and to help look forward because I position everything I do as goals versus dreams because a dream, a dream doesn't sound attainable, whereas a goal to me is attainable. You can actually like build steps towards it. Um, so moving forward, like uh, in 2021, I published my first cookbook, which is behind me, yay. Um, and I'm hoping that this year I can at least um, have a plan for my second cookbook and figure out like the specific, uh, publisher and book deal for it. I'm currently with Simon and Schuster, but like, I want to figure out like, that's one of my goals for, for this year going forward. Um, other goals that I have are related more to TV work. So I have a few different, um, TV related projects coming out, um, which some, which I can't, well, I have something for NBC today show coming out on March 29th, which is like a show on, it's going to be on Peacock and NBC. So like my goal is to do, um, much more TV work and hopefully have my own show one day because I do think that's the best platform to educate folks kind of at scale on um, vegan cooking and my culture and sustainable cooking. Um, and then my last goal, which I don't know if I can accomplish this year, is to not have to manage uh, all the careers that I do and to hopefully just do uh, Chef Priyanka full time. Um, so we'll see how that goes because that one is a little bit of a massive goal and I've been working in my tech career for quite some time so it's also hard to leave behind so mm -hmm. so yeah those are kind of those are the goals that I've outlined for this year that's amazing <laughs> we are rooting for you <laughs> thank you you're welcome uh Phoebe what's next for you um, I'm going to continue to learn the ropes of social media um, but also on a more serious note um when my boyfriend was building at the restaurant, I had been furloughed from my job at the time because it was, you know, right at the height of the pandemic. And I learned how to build out a restaurant with him. He didn't have a project manager. He didn't have a team to help him because there just wasn't the budget. And so we designed the restaurant ourselves. We picked every material. We sourced tile from China. That was a very specific tile that he wanted, you know, every decision we made ourselves. And I think that is an avenue I'd like to explore even further. I think, you know, talking about jumping into different careers in the food industry, it's exciting to think about what there is on the other side of just digital media, like more on the restaurant side of the industry. So I think maybe I'll explore that at some point. <laughs> we'll see though, Martha's very fun and hard to leave. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And Olivia, what about you? What's next? Yeah, um, more more socially, obviously, because that's what I do in my daily life. But um, I think in this year, I'm also hoping to do a little bit more writing for both of the brands I work at. I mean, I think I feel really lucky that I get to work at these at these wonderful publications with absolutely amazing writers and editors. And um, I think while I'm here, I really want to take more bigger opportunities to work with them um, for that. So I'm really excited about working on that this year. Nice. Well, thank you all so much for sharing, uh, you know, more about your work and your lives. Um, it's been a great discussion and I just, I'm really grateful that you guys were able to take the time to do this. Um, I'm going to switch and do some audience questions before we wrap up. So someone asked, what is your favorite food or dish to prepare? Anyone can go. <laughs> I can go first. 
Um, I'm a huge baker. I've always been a huge baker. Even when I was like a little kid, it was my favorite thing to do. Um, and I think sometimes just like nothing beats a really good vanilla cake with chocolate frosting. It's my favorite thing to bake. I feel like I bake it like once a month for like someone's birthday or someone's promotion or celebration. Um, and so that's, that's, I think my favorite thing. Yeah. What about you, Priyanka? This is tough because I don't like eating the same thing over and over again. And I'm constantly recipe developing, but uh, probably like some sort of noodle-esque dish. Um, I really like making different variations of like Indian inspired chili oils and, um, you know, mixing it with noodles and just like, I, I really do make up my own. I, I'm very... Um, Every time I post a video, I'm like, this is not authentic because then all the like people on the internet come and like attack you if you like post like chili oil noodles, but then I have like Indian stuff in it. So um, I, rec I recently made this, um, these chili oil noodles, but I didn't have noodles um, and I only had uh, bucatini. <laughs> so I made it <laughs> with bucatini, but it came out so good. Like you would, you really wouldn't know the difference. So definitely like usually making some like noodle-esque spicy vegetable sort of thing. Nice. And Phoebe? Um, with noodles on the brain, um, all I can think about is a dish that I grew up eating a lot, which is um, kugel, which a uh, noodle pudding, which I think everybody makes very differently um, depending on how their mom made, but mine is made with like 19 different types of dairy. And um, if I explained it, it, you'd maybe be a little bit grossed out, but it is very comforting to me. Um, and it is something that I make often when I'm missing home. <laughs> that sounds delicious. So I know that there's one more question um, in here. It says, to what extent do you use data in your marketing decision making and strategy? How about you, Olivia? Do you want to start with that? Yeah, um, all the time. Every, every decision, I feel like, has, um, has a lot of data. You know, I'm always looking at, like, what's performing well on our channels, what different content does well on different channels, what kind of photos are resonating with our audience, what type of posts are resonating, um, and also just looking at, like, what stories are doing really well on site you know what what are people gravitating towards is it seasonal is it is it not is it just that like people really want to know how to load your dishwasher like is that like some like some things like that resonate so I, I I feel like I'm I'm all and the thing is is that the data is always changing you know people are always clicking on different things on social the algorithm on social is always changing so I really feel like I start a lot of my days with looking at what's performing and and take take learnings away from that and then trying new things and looking at the data so yeah data is very important <laughs> it's my summer nice Priyanka I know you mentioned that you don't typically use tools for scheduling um so I don't know if you use the platform's data to inform your posting but do you want to talk about that yeah, I can talk about it from the creator angle. So like I am, um, because I'm a creator on all these platforms, I have like the creator dashboard analytics and like the professional whatever analytics on each platform to call something different. So I can, I can very specifically see like which videos are being saved the most, which are being shared the most. Um, and from those specific like details, I use that to be like, okay, well, you know, Generally, I notice videos with me in it tend to do better with than videos without, right? Because now I've established myself as someone who's constantly in their videos. So if I post something without me in it, it tends to underperform. Um, videos that have food ASMR, food ASMR is massive. Like any video that I have with food ASMR, like something sizzling, chopping, like all those different sounds um, do really well. Um, so you can see, like, I could see analytics for each of my posts and I just kind of go through it specifically on Instagram because that's my biggest platform. And then I use that as a determinant to do, um, to make other videos. But I think going back to our much earlier point that the virality piece of, of content that's out there plays a part here too, because even if you're not a massive content creator, 
but you make something that's trending, like um, the that gross baked feta pasta, which I never made because it looked disgusting, but like baked feta pasta, like if that's trending and you make your version of it and you're a smaller creator, you're bound to have that video um, get exposed a lot because people are just clicking on baked feta pasta and want to see it and it's getting served up more. So I think that trends definitely play into individual analytics on your own content. Sure. And then Phoebe, I know you mentioned that you do use that, like uh, when it comes to the menu, um, you know, with different dishes that might not be selling as well as others. Do you have another example to share? Yeah, definitely. Um, so there's a dish on the menu that is called an EXO rice noodle dish. Um, and the rice, the rolled rice noodles and EXO sauce is a very, very like classic Cantonese sauce. And the description, um, wasn't doing it justice, I think, for people. They didn't understand what was in an XO sauce. So it's a dried shrimp and scallop sauce. And they kept asking servers where are the shrimp and scallops in this dish when they're really finely chopped up dried products. And so we were able to use that as an opportunity to teach our audience about what an XO sauce is, the origins behind it, and why it was so important that that was on the menu at the restaurant. And it was really fun to see people's responses and some people make their own and some people were like, can we get your recipe? Um, which like, yeah, sure, we'll share, but it's gonna be a huge portion size. Um, <laughs> but I don't know, it's, it, that, I think that part of the restaurant was some, the restaurant Instagram was something I wasn't expecting how much people were actually gonna wanna learn about dishes. And that's been the best part people actually want, like, actually care. I don't know, I think of the internet generally as a not caring place. You, you tend to tune it out as you work in digital media, but when people actually want to learn, that's very exciting for me. Mm, definitely. Well, those are all the questions that I had for you guys, but before we say goodbye, uh, I just wanted to know if there's anything that I missed that you'd like to share. So Priyanka, is there anything about being on the talent side that I haven't asked that you'd like to share that you want to talk about? And then... Um, I mean, we covered a lot. I would say just um, for anyone on this call who is interested in being more up front of camera um, versus, I guess, you know, behind camera or like the, the actual magicians honestly said behind the camera, the people who are in the front of me are just like, yay. Um, but I would say if, if you are interested in really being like talent in front of camera or content creator that um, you really have to have thick skin, as I said, because you're going to have to deal with people on the internet, people on production sets, like people everywhere, maybe saying things that, you know, you could potentially be sensitive towards. So I think thick skin is key, just dealing with people in general, but also like you have to be comfortable with yourself and, and being on camera, right? Like the whole I, I get a lot of questions from people being like, oh, like I wanna, I wanna go on TV, but like I'm shy. I'm like, hmm, well, like <laughs> I don't really know how to help you there. Like you, you definitely it. want to want to be in front of camera because that energy really comes through, right? To the viewer. Um, and I would say like you you should really practice. Um, and I think that's what being a content creator on social media is almost all about. Like you could literally put out all the different content you want on your Instagram and TikTok is a great place for this because, and I think Phoebe mentioned this, that TikTok is better for like those kind of like raw, chaotic, like not buttoned up videos. And that's a great place for you to really like test your on-camera skills. Like how charismatic are you? How articulate are you? Like, can you make a recipe and speak to the camera? Like all of those things, right? So I would say use your social platforms as a way for you to practice if you are interested in being more front of camera um, and use all of this to make sure that you're succinctly and concisely building your brand. You don't wanna be all over the place. Like if people Google me or if they see me on Instagram, they see, okay, she's a vegan and sustainable chef and she's Indian. Like that's it. It's not like, oh, I, you know, I do like a million things, but you don't want all of those million things to come through because then it looks like chaos. You want to be very specific and pointed about what your brand is putting out there. So I would say, yeah, those are my last things, I guess, piece of advice to anyone who's interested. Thank you. So I know we only have a minute left. So I just want to, you know, thank you guys again for this wonderful discussion, both uh, panelists and audience members. Um, as a reminder, if you weren't able to view the webinar in its entirety and had to jump off, it will be available on the Boston University Alumni Association website and on the College of Communication YouTube channel. 
And I thank you again for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful afternoon. If you guys want to feel free to drop your social media handles in the chat for everyone to see. <laughs> thank you so much.